Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Horsley. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak here. This is the fun part of the lecture. I'm going to show you some really neat, interesting new things that I think will surprise you, especially if you've ever seen me speak before. Because uh, that's right, I have my own. But uh, because I'm going to contradict myself <laughs> and show you something really exciting. That is, if I can get my, uh, there we go. Firstly, a little bit of history. Uh, we saw some history of foot biomechanics. You've got to realize that prior to root, there was really only one thing in foot biomechanics, weak foot. Everybody had weak foot. And this is a great article, by the way, written by Royal Whitman in 1896, a study of weak foot with reference to its causes, diagnoses, and its cure. And I'd like to quote a little bit from that article because I really liked it. Uh, not, only, not only is it interesting, but it's beautifully written. Dr. Whitman writes, the object of treatment is to change the weak foot not only in contour, but in habitual attitudes. And by habitual attitudes, I believe he was talking about foot posture. To those of the normal, and in power of voluntary motion to those of the normal foot because a cure is impossible until function is regained. What Royal Whitman was basically saying in 1896, this man was so far ahead of his time, he was saying that posture controls function. But to Royal Whitman, a foot orthotic was not something you wear forever. In fact, he goes on to say, the weak foot, because of inefficient ligaments and muscles, unable to hold itself in proper position, must in many instances be supported until regenerative changes have taken place in its structure. Such support is necessary to retain the joints in proper position, otherwise normal motion is impossible. Royal Whitman thought orthotics were a temporary solution until you could get better. And he made this interesting device. And it was really not an orthotic at all, but it was a brace. And you could tell because of its three-point support. It had one point under the first metatarsal, had a huge lateral clip to prevent you from sliding off, a fairly large arch, no, half a heel cup, uh, no, no lateral side of the forefoot, it was, but was really interesting, it was made out of 18 to 20 gauge steel. <laughs> That's how you know it was a brace. This was not supposed to allow any motion to occur at all, and you couldn't wear it for very long. <laughs> it hurt. But Whitman was so far ahead of his time because he realized that the posture of the foot controlled its function, and today we know that form follows function. Now it's funny because I never understood that in school until I went to a lecture by Don Green on hammer toes and uh, he was up there at the podium going form follows function. I said, I pulled him in the hall. I said, Don, what does that mean? He said, Ed, it means if you walk around like this, you're going to be like this. And I said, oh, stupid angle. That makes sense. Everything we treat starts out flexible and over time becomes rigid. What he's saying is, when do you want to treat deformities? When you can still move them. Early. Merton Root, unquestionably the father of foot biomechanics. He gave us the language to talk about biomechanics. He, wa he laid the entire foundation for modern biomechanics. I can't give enough credit to Merton Root. Absolutely brilliant man. He wrote normal and abnormal function of the foot. They knew the importance of function. And what Root was trying to do was classify structural differences that you could measure in the foot and then correlate them to pathology later in life, which was an ingenious idea. He was a huge fan of Linnaeus, who basically did that for botany. And he taught us to use the goniometer, to lie the patient down on their stomach, bisect the heel, bisect the leg, take all of these static biomechanical examinations that we were taught to do in school. 
And in 1954, Mert took his best educated guess as to the corrected position of the foot. And I quote, I was standing in the shower without any thought about the foot at all, when all of a sudden the concept of subtalar joint neutral flashed into my mind. This is what turned out to be the key to my being able to contribute to podiatry. I'm not saying you can't come out with the most ingenious ideas in the shower. What I'm saying is, he just thought of it. <laughs> it was pretty, and I'm going to show you that that was an absolutely brilliant idea. And people have heard me speak before going, well, is Ed really saying that? Yes. We just came back from the Smithsonian Institute for the second time and doing some research, and we made some very interesting discoveries that validate much of what Roots said. Because Roots' rotational position around the sub taylor joint axis was actually, I believe, correct. He actually found the right position around the sub taylor joint axis. And I'll show you why it's correct in just a few seconds. Let's look at the neutral position theory of foot biomechanics. It revolves very heavily around the sub taylor joint axis. And because of root, we really are aware today where the sub taylor joint axis pierces the foot, dorsal anterior medial to plantar posterior lateral. And in the open chain, we have lots of motion around this because nothing is pushing these two bones together in the open chain. They can really move on each other because they can separate. But in the closed chain, the sub taylor joint actually moves very, very little during the postural change that we call pronation and supination of the foot. And neutral is one rotational position within its range of motion. He tried to encourage the foot into that position through a series of frontal plane, forefoot and rear foot wedges. You all know that, and this is an example of a rear foot post. And he taught us to lay the patient down, hang the foot out in space, and wrap plaster. He, what he was trying to do, which he was right, is you must have a three-dimensional model of the foot to work with in order to make it orthotic. And he was brilliant about that. But I see certain problems with singular axis theories in general. Let me show you. What do I mean single axis? Root's first major mistake was when you deal with a singular axis, it's a sin of omission. You avoid any postural correction. You're really not looking at all at a change in the posture of the foot. All the rest of the problems with neutral fall under this category. They're application problems. For example, how accurately can anybody palpate neutral position? Well, Mike Pernowski answered that question. Experienced foot care specialists are within plus or minus three degrees. Keep that in mind when I tell you how much motion occurs at the subtalar joint. Plus or minus three degrees. We're taking the foot out in space. We have no frame of reference at all. I know you all think that you, I mean, I thought. I thought I was the, the master of casting, the Leonardo da Vinci. But how accurately can you really cast? Well, you'll see in just a second. And how does he find neutral? Actually, by palpation of the tail and navicular joint. But you're trying to find a rotational position around the subtalar joint, right? In fact, you could fuse the tail and navicular and still have some motion in the subtalar, about 30% of its motion. What's very interesting, though, is that in the mass position casting, at the end of the cast, I would palpate tail and navicular joint, and every single person was in perfect tail and navicular congruity, which said to me, wait a second, neutral position is one component, a singular axis component, of the postural change we call mass, posture. So it's actually very close. And I'll tell you who pointed that out to me. I was down in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, with the Yucatan Crippled Children's Project. 
and Chip Sutherland was there, and he attended my course, and at the end of it, he, he thought about it for about two days, and then he talked to me, and he goes, you know, you and Root are not that far apart. And I said, we're not? And he explained this to me. And he, I realized he was right. Then Root taught us to hang the foot out in space and push up on the fourth and fifth. Up on the fourth and fifth, that's dorsiflexion, eversion, external rotation, the very definition of open chain pronation. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Well, how accurately can anyone cast the foot? Craig Payne studied it. He took 10 experienced doctors, 10 brand new students, and the guru of casting at La Trobe University. They all cast the same foot, Craig's. The guru cast that foot 10 times. All three groups had the same forefoot to rear foot angulation. All three groups. The range of variation was 10 to 12 degrees in each group and 16 and a half degrees between groups. I ran into Craig. I said, whose foot did you use? He said, mine. I said, let me see your foot. I grabbed his foot and I tried to move the forefoot. Craig barely has 16 and a half degrees total range of motion. In other words, they found every bit of motion that he had in that forefoot. It's kind of interesting. Why is this so important? Because the angulation between the forefoot and the rear foot is the major determinant of arch height. So let's add, start adding up our errors. Maybe there's a five degree error in the bisection of the heel, three degree error in the palpation, 10 to 12 degree error in the cast, in the forefoot angulation. We're starting to get into pretty big errors when we're only applying a four to six degree post. There's something wrong with that. So the labs, and I, I really learned this when I first got out of school. I went to visit one of the big, big labs. And they have this wall of casts, the receiving wall. And you stand back from the wall and you say, gosh, how do you use that one or that one or that one? I mean, the casts were unbelievable. They were, they were wild looking. And they said, well, we fill in the arches. <laughs> we just, we apply some level of arch fill. And I said, whoa, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because by filling in the arches, you just lowered the arch even more. So what do you end up with? A relatively low, flat, smooth, invented generic shape orthotic. Well, how do you eke out some function out of this device? Well, you got to look at the history of podiatry. Podiatry started out as a three-month course. All they could really do was trim corns and calluses and put pads on the foot. So they developed all kinds of pads. But the first thing I'm going to tell you about this low flat device is by the time your foot has pronated enough to hit it, you've already sacrificed the four goals I talked about. This orthotic is not going to prepare the foot to hit the ground. It's certainly not going to resupinate the foot by mid stance. It's not going to cause medial propulsion. In fact, the Georgia State study, the Cobb study showed it caused lateral propulsion and it's not going to help with functional hallux limitus. Unless, of course, we put the wedge on it, which would help, that would solve that problem. 